estamos agora numa crise muito grande. We are now going through a terrible crisis brought about by the 16-year occupation of our land by the Indonesian government. The time has come for us to tell the world of our problems. We can't hold back any longer. But it is very dangerous for us to even speak with you. The Indonesian secret police will be watching us and will try to pick us up at night. But we are even prepared to die for the independence of our homeland, East Timor. Dili, capital of East Timor. Under the cover of darkness, a terrified student tells of his country's plight after 16 years of Indonesian military occupation. occupation condemned by the United Nations in 10 resolutions. Yet Indonesia still calls East Timor its 27th province. The 16 years of that military occupation have spawned a succession of massacres and atrocities that independent observers haven't shrunk from defining as genocide. It is a story that has gone virtually unreported for 16 years because the Indonesian military has made it almost impossible to report. For 16 years, East Timor has been effectively closed to the scrutiny of the outside world, a locked off and forgotten island, a people that the governments of the West have been content to leave to their fate. However, we managed to penetrate East Timor, going undercover to detail its forgotten modern history. <laughs> They applied electrodes to my hands and they put them here and also here and on my tongue and also on my ears. Aleixo de Silva, one of 28 student activists taking refuge at the Motile Catholic Church in Dili, the capital. And this is the result of being cut by razor blades. Back here too, I was cut with blades and burnt with cigarettes and electric shocks here on the back. In 1985, they killed my brother in front of me and they also raped and killed my aunts and uncles all in my presence. And this is why my conscience makes me continue the struggle. Aleixo de Silva has since disappeared. Four hundred miles north of Darwin, at the eastern end of the Indonesian archipelago, lies East Timor. For over 300 years, it was a Portuguese colony. Then, in 1974, the Portuguese colonial empire began to break up. In early 1975, preliminary elections were contested by the rival independence movements. And in November,
November 1975, Freta Lynn declared an independent East Timor. But that was not before a bitter civil war, with Indonesia supporting Freta Lynn's opponents. Then in December 1975, with the knowledge of the United States, Indonesia invaded East Timor. December 7, 1975, Indonesia invaded East Timor. That was the beginning of years, three, four years at least, of massive destruction. About 10,000 troops with aircraft, helicopters, uh, warships took part in the invasion. And it was saturation bombing of the capital and other areas. Massive use of helicopter, mass uh, executions, including many other people, Chinese merchants, who had no loyalties to with one side or another. They ordered us to gather up the dead bodies and asked us to dispose of them. We were told to throw them into the sea. My uncle had been ordered to tie up the dead bodies of his own three sons and throw them into the water. They brought a group of Chinese over from where we lived in Comira. Before they'd even got to the harbor side, they were all shot from behind. They had no sense of morality whatsoever. Even when we kill animals, we, we make choices about which we will kill. But these murderers just shot everyone arbitrarily. Then they forced us to work and made us dig two mass graves. There was a captain shouting at us, and I, I, I couldn't understand what he was saying. I, I thought that was going to be the end of us. I was convinced that those minutes were my last, and that I would never see my family again. Among those killed at the harbor were people that we knew very well. It was like seeing your cousins and, and nieces and nephews being shot. We couldn't even cry. The Indonesian armed forces never left. The military drove Fretilin and its supporters into the mountains and began a continuing campaign to pressure friends and relatives to betray the resistance. Shanana Gusmao, the leader of Fretilin, remains in the bush today, still hunted by the Indonesians. His wife Amelia, now in exile, was interrogated in the hope that she'd act as bait to entice her husband out of the jungle. Era sempre insultada, cuspiam na cara. I was always insulted. They spat in my face. They'd get a gun. And pointing it at my head and in front of my children, they'd ask me, as they were pointing the gun at my head, how I'd feel if these two little children disappeared. And when they said that, I burst into tears. With grief for my children, but but more out of hatred at finding myself powerless to do anything about what they were doing. They came and went from my house and acted as if they were the rightful owners. to the extent that I was forced to live with one of their collaborators, a life which was very difficult and extremely offensive for me.
because of, of the humiliation that I felt for all women and for my own husband. But inside, I always felt that pride that I too was a woman and that I too was suffering like so many others for the love of our country and our children. By 1977, the Indonesian foreign minister acknowledged that up to 80,000 East Timorese might have died under their military occupation. Independent reports corroborated the use of napalm and chemical sprays, as well as bombing, food deprivation, deportation, and summary executions. After three years in the mountains, Ermelinda and Leonardo Araujo were starved out of their village by the Indonesians. First of all, they shot my husband and he fell to the ground. I didn't see this because I was facing the other way. My grandson was quivering. He, he stood up very still and saw his grandfather lying motionless on the ground. He began to cry. All of the children were crying. His children were crying. Grandpa, get up. Get up. Grandpa is dead. In 1979, increasing numbers of East Timorese were herded into resettlement camps. Amnesty International reported that between 150 and 300,000, up to half the population, were confined in camps. Malaria, tuberculosis, and starvation were rife. No reliable figures exist as to how many died. Surrender afforded no protection. I saw with my own eyes what happened in La Cluta. Among the 400 people, there was one pregnant woman. They slit her stomach until it was completely open. Another who was breastfeeding her baby, they, they battered them both until they were dead. Some fled. We managed to escape, but others were massacred. The country had become a killing ground. At Lake Tasitalu, on the outskirts of Dili, prisoners are reported to have been dropped alive from helicopters. It was said the water ran red with blood. In September 1981, at Mount Aitana, 400 people were executed. Eyewitnesses told of children being held by their legs and having their heads smashed against the rocks. In August 1983 at Kraras, up to 200 villagers were killed as a reprisal for the killing of Indonesian soldiers. Those too old or ill to flee were burned alive in their homes. In the same month at Malim Luro, a reported 60 villagers were tied together and made to lie on the road before being crushed to death by a bulldozer. Independent estimates vary, but it is now assumed that some 200,000 Timorese have perished in the last 15 years, one third of the 1975 population. Western arms have done much of the damage. The U.S. supplied 90% of Indonesia's weapons at the time of the invasion. Western governments have continued to sell arms to Indonesia, including British armored cars and Hawk fighters. American aircraft have been used throughout the long repression of East Timor. I must say all major powers 
but particularly United States, Great Britain, France, and to a lesser extent Australia, are guilty, are co-responsible for the tragedy in East Timor since 1975 because of the amount of weapons they have provided Indonesia and they don't have to continue the war there, but also because of their silence over the human tragedy in East Timor. That has been their major responsibility. And that has to do only with economic interests, trade with Indonesia, investments, nothing else. Australia enjoys a $1.5 billion trade with Indonesia each year. In 1989, they signed the Timor Gap Treaty, which gave them joint rights to exploit the estimated 5 billion barrels of oil in the Timor Sea. Indonesian companies also exploit Timor's other natural resources, marble, sandalwood, and coffee. The Indonesian monopoly means East Timorese growers get only half the price paid elsewhere. <laughs> the Indonesians have set about a complete transformation of the island's population and culture. Through a policy of transmigration, over 100,000 people from Indonesia have been settled into East Timor. Most of the businesses in Dili are now owned by Indonesians. The workers are Timorese. In the schools, children are made to learn and speak Bahasa Indonesia instead of their native language. has said there will never again be an independent East Timor. The human rights abuses continue. Early in 1991, Amnesty International said they were alarmed by the increase in torture and disappearances. Amnesty called it a systematic strategy to silence opposition. We beg the United States to look after us, to take into account all our difficulties. The tortures that Indonesia has been subjecting Timor to over the years, if there is justice, if other more advanced nations and the United Nations could solve the problem of Kuwait and Iraq, and if democracy is now flourishing in the former communist countries where now the flag of freedom is planted, then surely the same should be done for Timor, because Timor has suffered enough at the hands of the Indonesians. Throughout the autumn of 1991, the forgotten suffering of the East Timorese continued to be counted in funerals and graves. But in November, there would be one more atrocity. Only this time, it would be recorded for the world to see.
The people of East Timor are overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, a legacy of its status as a Portuguese colony. As they continue their struggle for independence, the church has become a focus for leadership and protection. The church's position is very simple. It is for the people. Why? Because as a church, we must defend the truth. And as we are defending the truth, Indonesia doesn't like it. That is why at the moment, the church must be courageous. It must be able to defend and lead the people to attain what is their own right. And that is their independence. And the church wholeheartedly supports them in that quest. And in the mountains beyond the cities, hidden by dense forest, others take a more dangerous road towards independence. The Timorese guerrilla army, Falintil. Vastly outnumbered, they have sustained an intermittent war of attrition during the 16 years of Indonesian military occupation. They are over this side as well as on the other side. That's where they're camped. They're about 500 feet away. 500, 600 feet. These guerrillas lead an isolated and dangerous life, moving only at night and lying hidden by day. This band of nine men is led by Commandante Alex David. This is the normal life of a guerrilla. One of the principles of our life is secrecy. But we are used to this hard kind of life. The guerrillas number between one and two thousand. They are concentrated in small groups throughout the country. Alex David is a most wanted man. The Indonesian tactic is to encircle the guerrillas with thousands of troops, but so far he has never been caught. I was eight when Indonesia invaded and I moved into the bush. My brother was killed and in November 1988, my mother was killed. Today, my father and other brother and sister are living under Indonesian control. But four of us have stayed here in the bush. men never see their families. Alex DeVee last saw his wife in 1979. She now lives with another man. She has her needs and the right to make a new life. I understand that because she has problems, problems caused by the war. It's up to her. I have one son. He'll be 12 years old now. And according to information I've received, the enemy persecutes him and asks him questions to find out if we ever meet or if I go to see him in his home. But my son doesn't even know me. He was born after I left the village. Despite their isolation, the guerrillas maintain contact by letter with their colleagues in the cities. Any resistance action in the city is coordinated from the bush. The guerrillas are dependent on the villagers who help provide food.
most important to the guerrillas is the acquisition of weapons and ammunition. They are nearly all obtained from the Indonesians. The way we operate is by setting ambushes. This way we can get the weapons and supplies that we need. Through our trusted comrades on the outside, we find out where the enemy is and we sabotage them. Over the last two years, the guerrillas have curtailed their attacks. They are expecting a long-awaited Portuguese parliamentary delegation to assess the situation in East Timor. The guerrillas are planning to come down from the mountains to meet the delegation and explain their position. We know that Indonesia is very powerful and that 16 years of hard fighting have proved it's not easy to smash an army of one million men. But we will never surrender. We will resist until we free our country, because our belief in our cause gives us strength. Autumn 1991, and down in the cities, the clandestine front is also preparing for the visit of the Portuguese delegation. Banners and flags are being brought out for their arrival. For the Timorese, this is a vital opportunity to tell the world of their plight. But the Indonesians have their own plans. <laughs> The Indonesians have begun with their threats for the total extermination of the people of East Timor or of any person who makes contact with the parliamentary delegation while it is in East Timor or anyone even taking part in a march. In other words, anyone trying to have anything to do with the delegation will be an annihilated after its departure. And Indonesia is, in fact, preparing seven mass graves, 18 feet deep, and six across. Yesterday, on the 18th of September, 1991, at 8 o'clock, all the villages of Narega were told to gather together and were addressed by a large company of the Indonesian army. When they arrived here, they said that we must not talk to the Portuguese MPs. It was forbidden. We were not even to approach them. Anyone who did so, they said, would be shot. Outside the Motile Church in Dili, one man already has been shot. 18-year-old Sebastio Gomez was killed on October 28th by Indonesian troops when they attacked the church where he and 27 others were taking refuge. If the Indonesians kill one person, if one person is shot dead in front of them, they laugh. That is why now it does not matter to them if they kill one, two, three, one hundred or even thousands of people. So we shall have to wait. All our hope is in God. We know that God will not abandon the Timorese people. The Timorese people have suffered a great deal over 16 years. That is why God is not going to close his eyes on the Timorese people. The clandestine front is still secretly preparing for the visit of the delegation. 
As we speak, the Indonesian military, along with their collaborators, are watching this house. They are just waiting for us to leave so that they can arrest us. We hardly eat at all. People don't dare come here with food for us. We drink only water. At night time, we are so hungry that we can't sleep. So we stay up and work preparing our banners. If the Portuguese don't come, many of us will be arrested and killed. There will be no time to hide. If they postpone or cancel their visit, then by the time they do come, most of us will be dead. So it's important that they come as soon as possible to resolve the situation and to prevent more deaths and arrests. In other words, they must cut short our suffering. Our motto is life or death, independence, so we are not afraid of dying. We'll fight on. We have suffered a lot and we want that suffering to come to an end. We'll even give our lives to stop it. But in late October, the delegation is indefinitely postponed. Despite Portuguese wishes, the Indonesians won't allow an Australian journalist to travel with them, and the MPs won't back down. Six a.m. November twelfth, the Motail Church in Dili. A memorial service for Sebastião Gomes is to be followed by a procession to his place of burial at the Santa Cruz Cemetery. That's why I am ready, even if the Indonesians want to kill me too. I am also ready because this is my fatherland. It's the fatherland of my grandparents. And already so much blood has been spilled by my people for this fatherland. That is why I am prepared to pay any price, even to give my life. Among the mourners are independent observers from overseas. As the Timorese leave the Motail Church, they unfurl the banners they had prepared for the Portuguese delegation. soldier is stabbed and wounded in a scuffle with the crowd.
arrival at the cemetery, the mourners are told to make their way to Sebastiao's grave to say prayers. <laughs> Around 8.15 a.m., a detachment of armed troops marched to the cemetery. want to kill me, then I'm, I'm ready for it. Domingo Segarado was one of those killed in the aftermath of the massacre. When the soldiers first approached, I mean, this is a very important point, the march was over. People were standing still. They started to move back when they saw the soldiers. The soldiers never said a word to the crowd. They didn't tell them to disperse. They issued no warning. They fired no warning shots. There were no stones thrown from the crowd. There was no provocation uh, at all. And also, there was no confrontation. It's not as if uh, there was a hot-headed 
soldier who fired first or somebody in the crowd uh, started fighting with the troops. There was nothing uh, of that kind. The soldiers simply rounded the corner, never breaking stride, silently, and opened fire on the crowd and kept pouring and pouring fire until uh, the people there were uh, scattered and, and destroyed, either, either dead or run away. We are literally against the wall. We cannot do a thing. Although we may have wives and we have children, we cannot do anything because they are armed and, and we are unarmed. This is not fair. We ask for justice. If we meet an armed man, what, what, what can we do but what he tells us to do? We have no other choice but to accept because the power is in his hands. Those who are able to resist do so, but they are in the forests. But we, poor souls, are left here in the town to their mercy and their tortures. <laughs> people are now believed killed in the Santa Cruz massacre. More died on their way to the hospital or after their arrival. It's reported that two days after the massacre, up to 80 witnesses were executed and buried in mass graves. Two weeks, the Indonesian authorities refused the Red Cross permission to visit the wounded until they had completed their interrogations. The commander of the Indonesian army said of the massacre, they had to be blasted. Delinquents like these agitators have to be shot and we will shoot them. I have every hope of being able to return to live in my peace, friendship, understanding, love that we always shared in our home. That is my hope for the family and for the nation. That East Timor may become like any other nation, free, independent, where all its Timorese children may enjoy freedom. They enjoy and experience the freedom that the children of other nations now have. At 9 Eastern, you'll be dazzled by some of our finest documentaries. Take a closer look at nature, history, science, and more. It's something different every week. Join us for Discovery Showcase.